Straight ahead, a decade of destinations right here on Rob on the Road. This time, it's California Collections. Explore John Muir's private papers, diaries, and drawings at the University of the Pacific. Oh my gosh. Take a rare look at protected and priceless works of art at the California State Library. See original hand-colored Audubon plates from the Birds of America. Absolutely exquisite. Go inside the Crocker Art Museum vault to see tucked away treasures. And walk through the giant red doors at the Chinese Temple and Museum in Oroville that dates back to the 1860s. All of that and so much more right now. And now, Rob on the Road, exploring Northern California. Hi there, I'm Rob Stewart. We're so glad you're with us for this half hour of Rob on the Road as we celebrate a decade of destinations. This time we're talking about California collections and this state has some of the most beautiful collections in the entire country. And one of those collections is right behind me, Capitol Park. It's 40 acres of beautiful trees and plants from all around the globe. This dates back to the 1860s. No matter when you visit Capitol Park in Sacramento, something is in bloom or in color. Just one of the many dazzling California collections. Here is Sean Sutton inside a room filled with Muir Works. Good to Hi, see Rob. you. How are you? Welcome to Special Collect. You have a cart filled with some fascinating things. So let's take this in the other room next to Muir's actual bookshelves and go through them. Sounds great. Right, let's go. Let's go, Sean. You got a big stack here. Let's. Oh my gosh. Did he draw that? He did. This is a this is a really nice file because it contains not only his writing but also a drawing by John Muir on oh. snow banners. So this phenomenon that Muir witnessed in the Sierra was one in which just the right combination of conditions created this visual where it looked like banners were streaming off the top of the peaks in the Sierra. I have to read this. The crown of the Sierra decorated with streaming snow banners was the most sublime storm phenomenon I ever witnessed. Oh my goodness. So what we have here is a manuscript draft of an article about a snowstorm. And we can see here that the initial draft was written in ink, but then Muir has gone back in pencil and edited some of his work on this article about Mount Shasta. Wow. Mount Shasta is nearly 70 miles in circumference around the base. I mean, literally, hands on, out in the field. Absolutely. Documenting the beauty of the West. And that's how Muir worked in a lot of ways, is he would go out into the field and keep a journal. Oh my gosh. So here we have landscapes in Alaska. Mm -hmm. You can see the, the impact that the land had on Muir and that he not only writes about it, but actually takes the time to sit down and sketch what he sees. He, his artistic ability is very much underrated. Yeah, he's, he's mostly known as a writer and he, and he was an outstanding nature writer, but his journals really reveal some artistic ability in terms of drawing as well. So we'll gently close up this journal here. Imagine him just carrying that around everywhere he went. And what do we have here? This is our earliest journal of Muir's from California. This journal is from January of 1869. And it records his experiences in, in, in the Yosemite and in the Sierra. And it also has this great signature, John Muir Earth Planet Universe. Wow. Uh, which, which eventually became his kind of famous byline, is that he saw himself not as a citizen of a city, state, or country, but of the planet, of the universe. And it really is kind of symbolic of his perspective. And this is great too, because um, here we have bird track marks that he saw in the sand along one of the rivers, and he's actually drawing the different the different tracks there. 
And then this is actual botanical gatherings that, what did he do, press? He pulled some leaves off um, a plant and used some sort of adhesive to apply them uh, into his journal. Muir was very much a botanist at, at heart, someone who understood and studied plants. Sean, what is this? Here we have a drawing that Muir made of himself. It's something of a self-portrait along with one of his companions. At this point in 1869, Muir is basically a nobody. Right. No one knows who John Muir is. But these experiences built the foundation on which his later career was, uh, was constructed as someone who really became one of the premier nature writers in America and is seen as a forefather of the environmental movement and the national park system. This is a letter from Teddy Roosevelt uh, dated May 19th, 1903. And this is a really important letter because in it, Roosevelt thanks Muir for taking him camping in the Yosemite. It says, my dear Mr. Muir, I trust I need not tell you, my dear sir, how happy were the days in the Yosemite. Yeah, because he's handwritten over That's the typing. Right. Yeah. Were the days in the Yosemite I owe to you and how greatly I appreciate them. And then these works, of course, helped go on to establish the national parks. Am I correct? That's right, absolutely. So this camping trip is seen as a really important episode in Roosevelt's um, commitment to this idea of federal protection for wilderness areas. For Muir, that was essential, is the, that wild places and, and nature areas had a spiritual or even religious significance for people. And his writings really focused on that aspect of being out in nature. And he communicated that through books and articles that really were widely read in the 19th century and played a really critical role in the American public coming to understand the importance of preserving these natural areas. I think Muir is a perfect example of someone, one person who can have an unbelievable impact on the world. I mean, he's been dead almost 100 years, but interest in him and the impact of his contributions continue to today and into the future. This book took my breath away. This is the great John James Audubon's Birds of America, the Double Elephant Folio, and this is, the, I think, the most beautiful book ever produced by an American. It's four volumes, 430 plates. Audubon, in conceiving this publication, wanted to have his birds delineated wow. full size. And the only way to do that was to have these great sheets of paper called double elephant folio sheets of paper. And there's no one in the United States, this is in the 1820s, that could reproduce them according to his satisfaction. So he first went to Edinburgh in Scotland and worked with a William Lazars. But what happened there is that his colorists went out on strike. And so he went to uh, London and worked with uh, Robert Havel and, uh, uh, to reproduce the plates. And the way these were made is you took his original watercolor drawings and somebody had to engrave them in reverse on sheets of metal. And then after a black and white reproduction was made, then a whole team of uh, usually women did the hand coloring under Audubon supervision as well as Havel's supervision. So these are all hand painted? These are all hand painted. So you could say that each plate is unique. So could yeah. you put a price tag on this? No, this is priceless. And there's about 110 complete sets that survive today. That's it? That's it. So these are just so glorious. Each time I see this, it is absolutely a breathtaking experience. I will tell you, I've never seen anything like this yeah, it just is, book wise is. in my life. But you can see too, this is not exactly, how would I say, Pollyannish views of nature. Oh no. He was out there in the wild. This is a real deal. He was showing birds and you know, they have to live. And you know, these birds of prey going after this duck. So it, um, look how beautiful. But he shows them in their habitat too, with the flowers, the backgrounds. And so in their tender moments too. The tender moment moments, beauty. right, yes. So it just is a absolutely dazzling, dazzling work. This is his companion volume, actually produced in this country. 
and it, uh, um, it was the Vivipars Quatrupeds of North America. It's a three volume work. Oh, wow. And these are beautiful hand colored uh, lithographs. These were done on stone as opposed to metal. And so again, this, these yes, show so the animals. It's a different. Yes, it's a different medium. But some would say, and I'd have to agree with them, that this is probably the most sophisticated book produced in 19th century America. This dates from 1845. You're kidding. And it, again, it's just as a superb example. And look at how the color is just and so vivid. And he worked vivid. with John Bachman, who did a lot of the backgrounds, whereas Audubon himself concentrated on the, uh, the four-legged critters here that you see. So again, these are wonderful landscape paintings in themselves, but it shows these animals as they were in their natural habitats. Just spectacular. spectacular right. And it just is uh, really a, a great glory of Americana that 20 years earlier, he had to go to England to produce the illustrations the way he wanted. By this time, America could now mm -hmm. produce books of great sophistication. And what do we have here, Gary? This is a beautiful this book. This is one of the great examples from the Incunabula time period. It's the Nuremberg Chronicle of 1493. They really? printed about 1,500 copies of this. Wait, you said 1493? 93, right, and this is, but look at the pages. They're, in, again, wonderful paper, so this will last for all time if treated properly. And uh, this was uh, written by Dr. Hartmana Shadel, who is the leading oh, look. scholar of the town of Nuremberg. And this is a history of the world from the uh, biblical uh, viewpoint from, I'd like to say, the Big Bang all the way up until 1492. 1492. You wanted to show us something yeah, in this Yeah, I wanted to show book? you Folio 100, and uh, that is the uh, actual city of Nuremberg. My goodness. Absolutely exquisite. Just take a look at the beautiful birds in this. Tell me about this book. Yeah, this is from John Gould's book on toucans, or tropical birds. And he was a publisher, and he pulled his financial resources to produce this great book, sold by subscription. And he hired or commissioned an artist by the name of Edward Lear to do the actual watercolor paintings to make the uh, plates from. And Edward Lear is a spectacular topographical artist, but some of you may know of him as a poet for his Owl and the Pussycat and the Land of the Jumbleese. Wow. And, uh, but these are just the beautifully color. rendered from Images, the 1800s? 1834. Now, I just realized something. We're not wearing gloves. Yes, and that is because there have been numerous studies done by preservation and conservationists that indicate that wearing gloves and turning a book can actually cause more harm, turning the pages of a book. If I was handling a glass plate negative, I'd wear gloves. But to handle a book and turn its pages, I would not wear gloves. Okay, so tell me about this beautiful yeah, book. This is a, a, a beautiful book on Mexico. It was published in Paris in 1836. And the artist was uh, Carl Niebel. And he went into Mexico and Look did these beautiful, gorgeous watercolors of uh, people, scenes of Mexico, the people of Mexico. Of uh, the Native American populations, but oh, I love this, this one of the poblanos. I love that. The ladies uh, with their uh, mantillas and, and uh, just the, the costuming, the dresses, the, the uh, senora over there. Beautiful. And it's been interesting over the years. Sometimes people use these as a typical Californios, too. Yet another priceless book. What is this? This is the Orchidaceae of Mexico by James Bateman. And, uh, in the 1840s, this was published in 1843. In the 1830s, there's a great deal of interest in orchid. There's a whole movement of orchid mania. You see the wonderful symbols, but there's a little cartoon done by uh, Cruikshank, kind of a little humorous spoof on the size of this book. It shows these lily puttings. Well, it is huge. Yeah, you're right, right, and just gives you an idea of the stupendous this. size of this large These are life fold. size. Yeah. Was that, that the purpose? That was the idea, too. So again, uh, this is just exquisitely hand-colored uh, plates here. So. Covered by linen, it looks like? Yeah, this is an interleaf uh, that uh, actually our preservation department uh, put in to help preserve these plates. Sometimes the pressure of the pages, the uh, oh, wow. watercolors, will sometimes uh, migrate. These are just beautiful examples of bookmaking. They are. You know, even in this digital age, it's so nice to see the real thing. And from the 1800s. From the 1800s, yes. Gary, thank you so much. All right, much. Rob. What a treat. Still ahead on Rob on the Road, more California collections.
a private tour of the Chinese Temple and Museum in Oroville. But first, behind closed doors at the Crocker Art Museum to see one of the most special drawings in America. The Crocker Art Museum's works on paper collection is? One of the best in the world. In the world. And you know, the fun thing here is, this is what you get the specialness of coming on a tour with me. Okay. Because the general public doesn't normally get to do this. Well, Come they get in. to now. Thank you. Where we're going is the vault. It'll take me a minute. I've got to, like, unlock it here. Okay, I love vaults. Secret code. My goodness. This is special. This is. In fact, most people don't get to do this, but you're special. Oh, no, 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 no. It's, <laughs> it's, it's because this is part of the community. Well, you know, and this is, as I said, um, the works on paper, uh, the, the museum's collection, our master drawings are world famous. This room houses those drawings. It also holds photography, Indian and Persian miniatures, Japanese prints, all sorts of artwork that are done on paper. And so these are closed up, they're sealed off. Can you show us some of them? I'm going to. Okay. Stay right here. Okay. And you know what? Mm -hmm. Keep your hands behind you. Okay. <laughs> you know me well. I am going to show you one of the most special drawings in America, right here in Sacramento. Wow. This is a work by an artist named Albrecht Durer. Okay. World famous. Many, many collections across the country have Durer's prints in them. Very few have his actual drawings. This is the first Durer drawing ever to come to the United States. First of all, another work on paper. This is a St. John the Baptist, but here's Albrecht Durer. This is Nude with Staff, done in 1498. Think about okay. that, 1498. Wow. Uh, 1498, Lyle. You can see that, and you can see the AD of his signature right there. This is a nude with staff. Uh, the, what she's holding in her hand is actually an artist's staff for drawing. Um, you, I love this drawing in that you look at her shoulder, it just kind of disappears as she's bending around. You see her muscular uh, nature of those shoulders. Um, this is when Durer was a fairly young man, just in his 20s. He went on to be one of the most famous artists in the world. Uh, this is the very first drawing by Albrecht Durer to come to the United States. Judge Crocker purchased it in 1869. People come from all over the world to study the Crocker's collection because it's so important, especially with German drawings. They also come because the works are so fresh. Mm. Uh, you look at works in our collection next to other works of the same time, and very often the other works are faded so much you can't really see the hand of the artist. You just said the hands of the artist. The hand of the artist. That's something that art historians study always, and you learn it better by looking at works on paper, by looking at drawings, than you ever do by looking at other media. And each of these files filled with beautiful works on paper. Okay. Another artist you might have heard of. Okay. Rembrandt. Oh, really? Really. So I've got this one. I'll just bring it over to you. Okay. Got this one set up. I thought that this would be fun. One, not because it is the most fabulous drawing in the world, but because here you really do see the hand of the artist. So this is very much a working drawing, a drawing where he's discovering the architecture of the final work of art that he wants to create. That is fascinating to me, Lyle, that these works on paper take you in to the talent and the thought process of the artist. You know what's interesting, people like Rembrandt, he worked with a variety of different studio assistants. So when you see his paintings, you see his paintings, but you also see his students' work in front of you. Um, here, it's all him. How old is this Rembrandt? This is uh, 16th century. 16th century, what a treasure. Isn't that great? It transcends time and place. It takes me that close to Rembrandt. Mm. That's pretty amazing. And so does the Crocker. I hope so, always.
This place is just beautiful. We're inside the Chinese temple with Vice Mayor of Oroville, Phil Chan Wilcox. Good to see you, Phil. Nice to meet you, Rob, and welcome to Oroville. Thank you. It's so nice to be here, and this place is beautiful, and you are part of the originating family that built this place. That's correct. Um, my great-grandfather came to Oroville in 1867, mm. and um, he was part of the, the ruling class in China, and he represented the emperor here in, here in Oroville and assisted the immigrants in writing home, collecting taxes for the emperor. They came here for gold? That came here for gold and other reasons. Well, well, let's go up to the altar because it is so beautiful, and you say that three religions were celebrated in this room, correct? That's correct. Um, this was is actually called um, Liet Sheng Kong, mm -hmm. and it's the temple of, of many gods. And uh, Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism is practiced here. All in one. All in one. Tell me about these beautiful boards along the walls. Are they are they prayer boards? They're prayer boards and they're uh, thank you boards. And what would happen is the immigrants would come here and they would make a request, and they wanted the gods to make sure that they were um, heard or, or the requests were seen. And these boards were actually carved in China. And um, if they were granted their request by the gods, then they would do a thank you board also. So it's a combination of both. And I can't help but notice right above here to the right of the altar. Is that a dragon head? That's actually a lion head. A lion head and it's from parades? Machine. From parades. They utilize that in like the Chinese New Year celebration. Yes. And they're made from paper mache. This is so moving to be here, to see these relics. Well, you know, it's probably something that I didn't appreciate when I was younger, but you know, as I've gotten older, I realized that this is a part of my heritage and is part of the reason I am who I am today. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm very proud to, that I have such a strong heritage that is actually traceable. Well, there's another special room next door that is special to you that I'd like to go see. Okay. Okay, come on, let's go check it out. In this room, is the final resting place, so to speak, of some very special puppets. Correct. Uh, when the theatrical troops would head north from San Francisco, they would come and um, do their shows. And this was a way of educating people regarding their heritage and different events that took place. Um, and some of these puppets, uh, we don't know exactly how many we still have in these chests. They were packed up um, in the uh, late 1920s due to floods. And they haven't been opened since. And they haven't been opened since. And some of them have been restored and they're in the tapestry hall here at the Chinese Museum. They are absolutely beautiful. This is what they look like if you pulled them out of the, out of these crates here though. Correct. So that took a lot of work to restore. I'm sure there are other restoration efforts are underway here as well. Um, we're in the process of trying to find someone to assist us in the restoration of these puppets. We're crossing through the courtyard here at the Chinese temple. This is so peaceful. It is. Um, it's serene. And a lot of people come and just sit in the courtyard. Um, as you can see, we have a fish pond over there. And, and they just sit here and meditate or, and enjoy the, the, the solitude. This is also more than the temple. This was the center of town. That's correct. This was actually the center of Chinatown here in Norville. Um, this is the council chamber and where the Chinese community conducted their business. The Chinese community took care of their own, basically. We, you know, we were not under uh, the Anglos who were in, in town, and uh, the Chinese would come here and have letters written home to send um, money back to China, and my grandfather, great-grandfather would collect taxes to send to the emperor. Wow, to the emperor in to China. To the emperor in China, so even though, you know, everyone pays taxes, Yes. Even back in, in the 1800s. Phil, tell me about the Fong Lee room. Okay, the Fong Lee room 
is um, a reproduction of the front room in my grandparents' business, which was also their residence. And Fong Li means big profits. You oh. know, in Chinese, everything is symbolism, and you don't name something or have something without it representing something else. And in this room, Herbs were sold Herbs for Chinese sold. medicine. Um, gold was purchased for the government because and weighed. And, weighed. and then sent back. And sent back to to you know Washington D.C. Mm -hmm. um, and also there's a family tree in there that shows our family tree from the 16th generation forward, mm -hmm. and we actually have information going back to 500 A.D. You're kidding for your family. For our family. Wow, that you know that just must be so special for you to be here and to know that your family was everywhere here. Oh, they were. And, um, you know, my grandparents had five sons and a daughter that lived to adulthood. And, um, you know, the Chinese or Asian way is that you live with your parents until you can go and provide your own home. And so the first five years of my life was in my grandparents' home. Well, a lot of lives were changed here, not just yours. That's true. A lot of Absolutely. people. Absolutely. It's been so good to be with you. Thank okay. you so much. Nice to see you. Yeah, nice to see you too for joining us here okay. on Rob on the Road in Oroville at the Chinese Temple. Thanks. And there are so many collections all across this state. Check out our website, robontheroad.org, where you can find lots of different collections from the Golden State. Thank you for joining us this half hour as we celebrate 10 years of Rob on the Road. And thank you so much for making the journey with me.